Lions Rock Productions. Hi, this is Darius Norman. I am the author of Rewriting Financial Rules at the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. Yes, you are on the Break It Down show indeed, and Darius has been a busy man, so I want to give you guys quickly a bio from him. Uh, he is a, well, first off, let's cover your education because it's substantial. You've got a degree uh, from Morris Brown College and then also a master's of social work from Clark Atlanta University. Uh, like you said, you are the author of Rewriting Financial Rules, and that's such a timely thing now because... It, I know folks from my generation, I'm 48 years old, you know, a lot of us just don't, we haven't mastered that thing, you know, the way the economy has worked and the, and just for, for whatever reason, my generation, we haven't saved a lot of money. And a lot of my, my people are, uh, you know, on the edge of, of credit problems and everything else. So this is a, um, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on was to discuss these things and kind of give some resets and some tips because this is what you do. You're a pro at this, and we talk to pros around here. So thanks for coming on the show, Darius, and thanks for dropping some knowledge on us. Um, for those of you guys who want to follow up with Darius, you can certainly grab his attention on, on Twitter at Norman Loves Raps, or you can go to his website, and this website is rewriting financial rules llc.com. Uh, let's talk about your book real quick. You know what? Let's not do that first. Let's do this. Let's talk about how you got to where you're at now. Because, like all of us, I'm sure you've made mistakes along the way and something in your head went, hey, dummy. And then you adjusted how the direction you were going. So, let's talk about that for a minute. Absolutely. Well, th- again, Peter, thanks for having me on. My story is pretty relevant to everybody else. You know, I I wanted to humanize and put a face to financial setbacks. Maybe four to five years ago, I had a tremendous setback financially. And largely, it was due to me, my own behavior, me overspending, not having a budget, living above my means. Mm. So with me doing those, having those habits, bad habits, I had to really make a self-assessment and just really look at where I wanted to go financially because what I was doing previously was counterproductive. Mm. So I had to make a conscientious decision. I decided to downgrade my lifestyle briefly. I downgraded. Actually, I had a roommate at the time. We shared a $1,600 a month condo downtown Atlanta. And so I decided to move from that particular Uh, residence and I moved maybe 50 to 60 miles outside the radius of the city of Atlanta and I rented out a one bedroom one bath apartment for this price $350 a month so it was a it was a drastic downgrade but it was needed for me to make the adjustments I needed to make financially so with me doing that I was able my expenses decreased so I was able to really look at what I was spending, uh, what my value system changed, my wants and needs. I kind of looked at my wants versus my needs. And so with that, when I was living in that $1,600 a month apartment, my credit cards were maxed out. I was delinquent on my student loan debt. So with me going to that one bedroom, one bath apartment, I started attacking my debt. Because all of my expenses decreased, I didn't need much to really, you know, carry on with my day to day expenses. I started paying off my debt. And so from there, I started to with with me having those, you know, living above my means, my credit went bad because, like I said, I maxed out my credit cards. I went to link with my student loans. So I started working on my credit. I actually worked with a credit repair company. And so they were great. But then I started researching and learning some strategies myself to repair my credit. And so with me doing that, the outcome of me making this choice, I was able to purchase a home after this process with going to the closing table with zero money down and with a 3.8 percent interest rate at the closing table. Also, I was able to purchase another car. And my car note is at a hundred and I have a hundred and seventy dollar car note payment. Hmm. 
Mm. And I know that's unheard of now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. but, but I needed to go through that procedure um, just to go down a different path financially. And I know as Americans, we are consumers. We're a consumer-driven nation. And, you know, we feel like if we don't obtain certain things, credit is easily extended out to us. And a lot of times we don't count the cost before we purchase anything. That's for sure. I've got a number of friends that I think about and they'll say things like, I need this. Or, or they'll come in and, and they'll be, they'll be I don't know, visiting or something. Or I'll visit them and they'll say, just bring a bottle of wine or whatever. And so you bring a bottle of wine, but sometimes they bring three, four, five, six different things. And you're like, you didn't have to bring all that stuff. you know. <laughs> and it's... <laughs> It's like death by a thousand cuts, you know, like, uh, so I'm an army guy and and you go out on patrols, you you don't want that much weight because sure, this knife doesn't weigh a lot, but neither does that little piece of food and and, and this water doesn't weigh that much. And the next thing you know, you've got 50 extra pounds and you can't do anything. It's uh, the same thing with these financial decisions and what we want versus what we need, you know, and, and it's okay to, it's okay to need a massage. But work to that point, like master your your finances first. I get what you're saying, kind of reorient on, you know, what kind of dwelling do you need? Do you, do you need a dwelling that stokes your ego, or do you need something that's uh, that just takes care of the 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 enclosure that you need to live in, or is it something in between? Absolutely, absolutely. I totally concur with you. You know, and I think too, it's bo- it boils down to how we are in America. Everything is driven by materialism. So a lot of times we feel like we're not significant if we don't obtain the social status from the external forces like our friends, our family members or just, you know, overall society. How we're viewed is more so important. And then that drives our behavior a lot of times to overly consume. Now, I know growing up, we sort of had these kind of topics in, in school. I mean, you, you had an opportunity to go to an accounting class, but you didn't have to, uh, you know, your parents kind of guide you. Like my dad used to balance the checkbook all the time. And I literally have never bounced my checkbook ever in my life because it just never <laughs> mattered to me. You know, right. cause computers did that for, for me. Even, yeah. even me, I'm almost 50 years old. I'm like, there's a computer that does that. And I know basically what I have. So I'm not worried about balancing it, you know? So right. some of the, and I have to imagine now there's even less of that stuff. I know my my daughter, who's she's in college, and that's like when I graduated, they didn't teach us about money and savings because it's only uh, been what I've been able to tell her. And even then, if she was more consumer driven, which thankfully she's not, like I could see her spending all of her money on, you know, on yoga pants and coffees and, you know, the Uggs and, you know, sunglasses and stuff. Right. What, what what's what happens? I mean. How do people learn these skills that you've attained yourself? And what, what's supposed to be the normal path? Well, I'm glad that you brought that point up because there's research out there. I think the Federal uh, Reserve indicated it was a recent research they um, indulged in back in 2014 where they highlighted that, you know, most states in America now, high school students are not required to take an economical course. Like you stated earlier. So yeah. a lot of times if you don't, if your parents are not, don't have the discipline or they don't have the literacy to pass on to you, you're kind of somewhat stuck in terms of learning through the school of hard knocks at, at some point. Yeah. You know? Do you think, is it more common that you have to go bang around and find your own solution then than to, than to have parents that can instill good financial consumer values? I do. I do. And I think in particular in certain communities, it's it's even more um, it's 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 worse because mm. of the cycle of being in debt, the cycle of not having the financial literacy or the importance of understanding the importance of obtaining the savings or balancing a checkbook mm. or what is a credit score, certain communities and certain they they just don't have the literacy, and so some of the habits are passed down to the kids, and it's generationally. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so nowadays, you know, millennials. I'm glad to hear that your daughter seems to she seems to have a balance because millennials nowadays we have the access to the telephone and Google. So now you can Google information, whereas your generation, my generation, we didn't have the access to information as this generation does so 
you know, it's, I do think it's still based on personal accountability. How do, system. But uh, how do people, be, you know, how do you develop that accountability? I mean, obviously, you know, that's something that you help people with. But what is, what does someone do, like, as someone tries to figure it out, or whatever generation they're from, how do they develop the accountability? Is it going to YouTube and watching videos on consumer accountability, or what's the source? Yeah, totally, yes. And I, I would encourage, because there are a lot of authors out here who are, has a lot of dearth of knowledge you can go to, you know, read books. You can actually attend classes. There's another research that indicated that individuals who take uh, accountability with their own personal finances, if they go ahead, go ahead and, you know, enroll in some courses or what have you, their credit scores are seven to 10 points better than someone who does not take the initiative. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can actually... You know, again, I think, you know, there's a lot of resources out here. You can read books. You can attend seminars. Some college, community college um, and universities provide free financial literacy courses also that you can attend. Okay, so so you can go out and you can find a lot of different sources. But one of the things I know, too, is, is and we're going to get to your book and talk a little bit about that in a second, but there's a lot of people out there that don't necessarily have the pedigree and don't have a good base of knowledge. It's just something that they're passionate about. They've picked that and said, I think I can help people. And they get out on social media and you can develop a following and yet not really be founded in solid financial principles. How do we... How do we know where to start? How do we sort through all this stuff? Because it seems, look, you know, I know, it can be overwhelming where you're just like, kind of like, there's no point. I'm broke. I'll spend this hundred bucks because it doesn't matter because that hundred bucks is going to go somewhere. I don't got enough hundred dollar bills to give out to everybody who needs them. So I may as well buy this dinner out on the town. Well, I think too, it's based on that person's value. If you're looking to purchase a home or a car, or if you're a small business owner and you need additional capital, you need, I mean, they're there are certain rules and there are certain disciplines that you should have in place to get you to that point where you won't have to overspend or overpurchase a home or a car mm -hmm. and saving money down the road um, if you make the, you know, choices. So if you want to continue to rent, renting a lot of times, it's not a bad thing. But the first step to, I think, then I, I had to learn it. The first step, I think, to you know, to set yourself in a different path financially is to become a homeowner. Mm. If that's just buying you a small one bedroom, one bath, two bedroom, two bath, you own land because land is never going to be uh, made again. So that's a precious commodity. Unless so you're the I Chinese. <laughs> with the intellectual property they stealing so yeah I, I agree with you but yes <laughs> well they're making <laughs> islands out in the uh out in the pacific too they're they're just they're building i don't know if you know about this but they're dumping dirt yeah. down and they're like we're gonna make more land uh oh, uh, oh and actually out, out in the arabian peninsula they they keep uh building up these resorts you know they they put more right more sand up. but that certainly is not low cost land that's enormously you know to the cost to do that is not what we're talking Absolutely. about it. Absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, one of the things out here in California is the cost of a home is is so enormous. I'm, I'm curious what your thoughts are on this because half a million dollars won't even really get you into anything that doesn't cost another $250,000 to get it to the point where it's it's in good shape and good repair what does right. someone out in california do i mean how do you how do you ever save up enough money to be able to put down a down payment on a home when they cost i mean seven hundred thousand dollars easy there's all kinds of people that try to buy a home and you have to come in 20 percent above asking just to play and, oh yeah it's rough so well i mean what do you do then do you do you put your money in other markets and just accept that you rent and uh and try to do that if you want to live in california or what do you do out here that's a tough question because here i'm in georgia and we have home buyers programs here for first-time home buyers where they give you up to ten thousand dollars for purchasing your first home mm -hmm. so i don't know if California has those first time home buyer programs that are available for new home buyers. But I will say 
I mean, y- you may have to look into other markets or maybe move outside of the sure. radius. Yeah. I mean, and that's terrible because really I can't speak to that because I'm in a totally dem- different demographic where we're buying homes here for ninety and eighty thousand dollars, maybe <laughs> we two can to buy three thousand. Ten of them out of here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I can buy so a neighborhood. I, and that's unfortunate. And I mean, I think, and I'm, I'm hearing also you guys property taxes going up also. Yeah, Tremendous. property taxes is, is uh, always interesting out here. Yeah, they've worked to try to control those things, but just you know, the Silicon Valley is such a powerful uh, area, and then you know the coastline obviously affects things. So it is it is a challenge for sure to try to get the uh, the home buyer thing figured out. Hey, let, let's transition. Let's talk a little bit about your book because I mean, that's ultimately you know what I want people to understand is that there is help out there, and you do provide services for this stuff. So. Um, let's get into rewriting financial rules. What What is the book about? How did you get inspired to write it? Well, the book is about, you know, basically the components that we were discussing previously. Me having my own setback financially. I wanted to put a face to it. And also, I wanted to provide a tool for each individual who had who has credit or financial setbacks like I did. Like mm. I had some extreme financial woes and extremely credit issues. Like, like I said, I, my student loan debt was out of control. Right. I had met out credit cards. I had debt collections and I had debt collectors calling me on a day to day basis. So I created rewriting financial rules to give everybody the step-by-step process. I utilized mm-hmm. all the research I used to pull myself up. I went from a 527 credit score to a 720. Wow. Within maybe, I want to say, Peter, maybe a year. Like I said, I went back to that one bedroom, one bath apartment, mm-hmm. and I just zoned in and focused on that. Hmm. And so I uh, I created that book to give you step by step process to ways to repair your credit, understand credit repairing. The second step out the credit repairing, how to build your credit scores. And right. I list three components, how to build your credit scores, as well as there are some protection strategies that I uh, wanted to educate the average consumer on. Um, a lot of people don't understand that there are state as well as federal agencies in place for you to protect you against the debt collectors or if the companies are not following rules and regulations with the report negative items on your credit reports, there are some steps that you could take as a consumer to protect you as well as give you the leverage to deal with those hard issues. But this is something that a regular person can do. Like in your book, you sort of break that down then so that they can they can really get to work on this themselves. Because that's one of the things, right? Like when you don't have money, everybody wants money to help you. And you're like, but I don't right. have any money. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And see, that's the thing. Credit is a way to, it is a way, it is a form of money if you know how to use it and leverage, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. What about using credit to to invest? I mean, like if you look at, oh, uh, I don't know, um, you've got an opportunity to buy stock, for example, and right. you want to take, or let's just say a friends and family, you've got a friend you believe in, he's got a great idea, and you're like, yeah, you know what, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick my neck out on this two grand. If I lose it, great. Um, can you can you in a smart way leverage your credit to? put money into something else, you know, because if it, if it hits great, you know, you're going to pay off at a rate greater than what the credit thing would go. But is that reckless or is that something for later on when you're more stable or what are your thoughts? Well, definitely. I mean, in particular, say like you have a daughter or you have a best friend or what have you, or your significant other, your wife, say they do want to venture off and start a business or if you see a great investment. There's a, And I talk about it in the book. I don't know. I'm pretty sure you may be, you know, pretty savvy and and understand this particular strategy. This particular strategy is called piggybacking. Mm. And piggybacking has been in place for many years. A lot of people, you you know, the business world, and a lot of people in the credit consumer 
if you understand this particular strategy where say for you for instance peter i'm pretty sure if you had a ten thousand dollar account or personal loan account Mm -hmm. and you had it maybe five to ten years you've never been late on that account you never made any late payments you 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 don't overutilize that particular credit balance i mean that particular credit line Mm -hmm. well you can add your wife or significant other or best friend who you feel like you believe in their dream to mm-hmm. um, establish a business or they need just the actual actual credit boost. You can add their name onto your credit line. Hmm. And that great history that you have on that so-called maybe $10,000 credit line will show up on their credit report as if they had it maybe ten, maybe five years or so. Yeah. Yeah. So you can do that. Yeah. Huh. Go ahead. So you know you so you piggyback your credit on to some for somebody else that you want to help out and that right. enables them to either borrow money at a better rate or, or something like that. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. And I'm glad that you brought that point up about investing because when I made my adjustment, Peter, myself, I, my value system changed. I started invest buying stock every week. Yeah. Um uh, you know, and I think that's just important. You know, you, 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 your value systems change. Yeah, that's huge to hear that because I know, like, one of the things I do is, is a so I, I'm, I'm pretty big on, on crypto as, as a, uh, a means of a new way that everybody's going to be doing business. And, and right. you know, who, who knows if I'm right or not. But when I look at the market, I, I see, like, well, you know, I see the efficiencies that, crypto will create and i believe that there will be a long-term cryptographic finance future for the uh for the place so what i do is and this is not financial advice to anybody else this is just what i do i take money that i can absolutely lose 20 to 50 bucks a week absolutely and i i buy some piece of crypto and i purposefully divest I mean, to diversify, I should say. I diversify out and I buy Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin, Ethereum, and right. I go back onto the actual I, – I go to the side where you have to have actual crypto to buy other coins, and I buy the alternate coins. And I buy right. things that – I buy things that look like shovels, you know, and Levi's because I don't I don't want to strike gold. What I want is to sell shovels and picks to all the people that are going to go look for gold because that's fantastic. So I look for things that are financially based. So like Ripple and there's one coin that is used for uh, just transactions. It's like it's called gas. So I buy that right. one because everybody's going to need to use that as they do. these. So I look for those things to diversify and then I also buy blue chips and, you know, occasionally I buy something that's a little more risky, but, I, but I've spread my risk out in a way that I'm pretty comfortable with. And, and though I don't have a lot of money, I'm kind of in the middle of the process that you're at where I, I really simplified everything and said, right. now it's time. Like I had a really bad case of PTSD where I just couldn't get anything done, but now I'm getting little things done. Slowly Absolutely. building a ramp while I uh, while I get out of the hole that I'm in, you know, and so when Absolutely. I get there, I'm already running. I'm already investing each each uh, each week. But but so someone like me who does uh, have some credit things to clean up and everything, you're saying that maybe 12 months, 18 months down the line, I can be in a pretty good position as long as I continue to do the little things and, and just do incremental steps. Absolutely. It's a step by step process. Also, it's based on your financial picture, you know, and the most important thing when you're working on your credit and you're tr- beginning the repair process, the first step you should take is to pull your credit reports hmm. because based on the Federal Trade Commission's research, they indicated that 79 percent of Americans have some wrong or some discrepancy item on their credit reports and six over 65 percent of Americans do not even know their credit scores or review their credit reports. So with that, those numbers, that's an indication that a lot of Americans are paying more than what they should be paying Mm. because they may have negative items on their credit reports. So the first step to begin your, you know, the, the, the steps of actions to begin to change your financial picture when it becomes dealing with your credit is to just pull a simple credit report. Mm -hmm. 
And then does that, that's another thing was they're like, you want to pull a credit report? Hey, that's $15. And you're like, God damn, everybody <laughs> wants my money along the way. <laughs> but, but is that just a fact of the matter? I know you can dig around and try to find someone to give it to you for free, but it seems like they, even that costs some kind of access to, you know, my credit card number or something. What's, what's your recommendation on when someone pulls a credit report, pull all three, pay $15 for the service. What do you think? Well, there's a free service called annualcreditreport.com. You can go and pull your credit reports once a year for free. For free. From each, every three bureaus, yes. And it, it's important for you to pull from all three bureaus to see what's being reported mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't understand. All the companies, all the financial institutions don't report to all three okay. bureaus. So there may be information on your Experian report that's not being reported to your TransUnion or Equifax report, whereas you may have something only on your Equifax and TransUnion, but not on your Experian. And so it's important to yeah. look at those credit reports, seeing what's being reported, look at the balances, the dates when they were open or closed, if there are any kind of collections on your credit report, or do you have any late payments that are in um, question, or are there any, just any discrepancy that you identify, you know, you that's the importance of pulling your credit report. So, okay, so but if you're in financial distress, you quite often are late because you've got a Rob Peter to pay Paul. What do you right. do about that? I mean, that doesn't take a year to get over. That thing just sits there. So how do you deal with, you know, a series of late payments that, that really what that equals is, you know, though you're crappy at paying on time, you are a survivor. You are paying your bill. It's just you, you're in survival mode. What do you do to right. repair that? Well, with late payments, if you most companies, you can actually call them and discuss, you know, that you're having financial hardships. You can actually even send in letters. A lot of times we don't even like to send letters or write letters. You can actually send in a goodwill letter mm -hmm. asking for the company to remove those 30 or 60 day or 90 day late payments mm -hmm. because you had a financial hardship. Yeah. And mo most uh, some will remove it off. Yeah. But then, you know, the ones who will not, you can go through the process of disputing that. You have that right to dispute any item you feel like is not being reported accurately. And it's up to that company to prove it. Right now we're talking to Darius Norman, the author of Rewriting Financial Rules. He's talking about how to help it. I, in particular, need help with this because I'm still digging my stuff at, you know, out of my hole. I'm, dig I'm digging myself out of the hole that I dug. And I'm, basically, right. I'm building a ramp. So if nothing else, you're helping me to understand it. But I, one of the reasons why I thought it was cool to have you on is so many of us don't have savings, you know. But also, right. we're living longer, right? Like, having a career start when you're 50, that doesn't mean anything anymore because everybody – everybody's living past 70 and 80 and deep into their nineties nowadays. So this right. is, uh, this, you know, if you feel like it's too late, it's certainly not definitely a guy. I'm almost 50. There's a reasonable expectation that as long as I take care of myself, I can live another 40 years. Absolutely. And not be like uncommon. So, you know, I, right. I do have time to, uh, to do this and it's, it's cool. And when people go to buy your book, what do you, what helps you the most? Amazon? What, where's the best spot to get it? You can pick it up either from Amazon or Barnes and Nobles .com. Okay. I also have it available in the ebook format. It's a simple how to. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner. Or at John LG69. At the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. Formula, how to, you know, educational tool for um, if anybody to understand it, even a toddler could get it. If yeah. They read it. And I wanted it to be simple, but can I highlight something about Please. Things? I'm glad that you're bringing this part up because also, you know, with technology being here, it's so plentiful now. I I'm, I'm with you. Like I invest every week too, but I there's a app that you can actually download called Stockpile, and you could buy fractional stocks into different companies. Like you were saying, diversifying your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Like I buy into Facebook or Snapchat, 
and it's a it's a to me I I can call it an aggressive savings account because you can buy into companies that you love and utilize, and while the market is doing well, your money can be growing because the banks well they just raised the interest rate, but the banks and credit unions for so many years were not paying you any interest on your money, so your money was not growing. Right. So if you open up a stockpile account or Acorns account or maybe a stash account where it's going into the market, you can see your money grow tremendously. Yeah, that's a good point that just even like you said, the, the little Acorns, those kind of companies that you can slowly invest into, it's uh, it definitely is a difference maker. I mean, with my strategy with crypto, right, 20, okay. 20 or so dollars a week. Well, shoot, that's over a thousand dollars a year. And if I happen to get a, every now and then, I'll do more. I'll do twenty five or fifty, but somewhere right. in that range, I, I'm we're talking fifteen hundred or more dollars a year being invested. And if that grows at any kind of rate, and yes, it's speculative as hell. But if it grows right. at any kind of rate at all, and then then all of a sudden I, I'm sitting pretty, and my my investment is is something that's minor. Like we we always use like it's a couple cup of cups of coffee a week, you know, that I can <laughs> skip, you know. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, and even for our teenagers or our, you know, kids, children, like if, you know, our kids love Snapchat, they love Facebook, you could buy them fractional shares for mm -hmm. $10 yeah. to $20 a week if you want. Yeah, that's totally true. You can buy a fractional share of a lot of things and, and slowly build something up. I was going to ask you also, too, the, just to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the fancy term is dollar cost averaging. But just because the market goes down isn't a bad thing. That correction, that volatility, you know, as long as your stock doesn't completely go out of business, like the other day. Uh, Bitcoin took a huge drop and I'm like, perfect, it's on sale. And I went and I right. bought Bitcoin that week because I got a better <laughs> price than I would have the week right. before. Right, right, right. Absolutely. And what I did that with my Facebook stock. Like, I sold it. I let it, you know, because of the volatility. Right. I sold my shares and then I, I'm, I'm saying, well, I'm going to let it correct itself and then I'm going to just buy more because it's cheaper. So yeah. I'm, I concur with you. Yeah. I, uh, for years, and I haven't done it actively in a long time, but I was managing my daughter's uh, account. And I bought BP because when the market crashed, it went down really low. And right. it, it just has this pattern that I had picked up where it'll go up a dollar, a dollar fifty, and then peak out, and then everybody will sell, and it'll drop down. You know, by about a dollar twenty-five, and so that I buy the exact same amount of stock, boop, and then and then it goes up again, and I would just continue to do these hundred, hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty dollar reapings each time, yeah. and it would be like every couple of months I would be buying and selling it because it would just it had this natural pattern of of wanting to be bought and sold. Uh, it wasn't like I was a math genius, but I was able to make quite a bit of money over the course of a year in her right. account and, and buy more shares or take those winnings and put them into something else that's doing another pattern like that and just slowly right. creep it up. And so, so even though I, I'm not technically buying and holding, I really kind of am, you know, like I'm, I really, I'm looking long term. I'm just saying, Oh, this is going to go down again. And if it doesn't great, I just, I'm patient or I buy something else, but it's a, um, this stuff isn't that hard to do. Where where do you go to get advice uh, for for buying stocks and the fractional shares kind of thing? Well, I have a friend of mine who's a, he's a he's a well mature investor. He's been investing for years, and um, he actually has a podcast show called The Power of the Done. Nice. And so. He uh, he it gives me the education and gives me the literacy about stock and where to purchase. Yeah. And so I am, you know, and I, I do research myself. I'm not a I'm not such of a great investor myself. I'm I'm like you also, Peter. You know, I kind of just watch the market and see look at trends. And if I feel like it's time to sell, I'll go ahead and sell and let it bottom out and then buy more shares. You know, yeah, so I'm kind of like you. 
Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's definitely something that's doable because Lord knows if you and I are doing it, <laughs> like it can be <laughs> it can be done by the best of them. Uh, I want to say you know, so the book is called Rewriting Financial Rules. Uh, Darius is a smart dude, and as you can hear, he's super personable. and And basically, what he wants to do is 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 help help you get out of the spot that you're in and help you, you know, start to use your money to more your advantage. I mean, whether it's a, a, I got a friend who's got a podcast and he talks specifically to young black men. He's, he's a black dude himself. So he's like, oh, wow. he's like, Hey, listen, our culture is messed up. We got people yeah. teaching us to do the wrong things, eating the wrong food, yes. um, buying stupid shoes. Like, no, yeah. stop, man. You're being played by everybody. And, yes. and, you know, though he's talking to, you know, a young black male audience, secretly I listen and I learn too. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know what? You're right. So I literally, like, I simplified my wardrobe. I don't have 500 shirts anymore. I, you know, I, I simplified it. And when something wears out, I, I buy a new one. And I don't have that constant craving to buy something all the time. You know, I can go to a store and be like, meh. Uh, there's nothing here. I don't need that candelabra. Uh, I don't right. need this fancy knife. I, I'll take my knife I have and I'll sharpen it and use it again. And man, right. that that approach. And it's not like I'm Spartan. I don't have things. But what do I really need? And I just I don't need a new knife. I just sharpen the one I got. Right, right. And then I guess too, after you buy so many shirts or suits or whatever you know, whatever is to your liking, after you buy so many of, of those items. After you wear them so many times, it's like, okay, well, what's to you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Or then, like, you have things like, when did I buy that? Oh, shit, I bought that shirt 10 years ago. I've worn it three <laughs> times. Why the hell did I buy that shirt, you know? It's almost like, uh, for me, I, and I'm sure this wouldn't apply to you, but, like, if I go to the strip club and I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm going to spend $1,000 here, then you're like, what the Absolutely. fuck was I doing? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> And then you think you think about the next day, like, darn it, man, she didn't even like me. I you know. know. <laughs> She's not here anywhere near me. God dang it. I just gave all that money away. But it really is, like, it is the same thing. Like, you get into that right. moment, you see that polka dot shirt, and you're like, I can work that. I can work that polka dot shirt. That's exactly my style. And then you go home, and you're like, what the fuck was I thinking? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and then these polka dot shorts that I got talked into because they came with a set. Oh. What was I thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Hilarious. All right. Well, look, I appreciate your time. It's such a great thing to talk about. And really, like, especially Gen X, like, we're just, you know, we've we've had a lot of opportunities to see and do a lot of things. But one of the things right. we haven't been great at is saving money for the future. I mean, most of us don't have a real savings. And uh, it's not too late. We really can get control of this stuff. Because at some point we're going to have to live on a smaller income, you know, like as you get older, you know, especially elderly, you don't make more money than you made the year before you survive no. on less and less. So it's time to get serious about getting serious, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad you pointed that out because it was an article USA today last year. Sometime they indicated that seven out of 10 Americans do not have $500 savings. So that means an emergency shows up, they don't even have a savings no. to oh five hundred dollars to even address an emergency. So with that alarming number, a lot of Americans are pushed to overextend themselves in credit if they can even get a credit. You know, right, right, right. And then you end up spending a lot of money for that bad credit because because you're desperate. I I know I, I had to I had to buy a truck and I was in a spot and I'm like I know I'm gonna get screwed but there's nothing I can do. I'm in a spot. I gotta have this right. truck. You know, right, right, right. and uh, it, I didn't buy it because I was like, I love this truck. I bought it because I needed a truck to go do the work that I had to do. And, you know, I'm going to be paying it off for a long. I'm going to drive the hell out of that truck. <laughs> but, you know, I was in I was in it because of my credit. You know, I was lucky to buy something. And so, yeah, they're going to take advantage of that. And, and right. God bless them, you know, so it just is what it is. What advice do you have? Anything else for anybody else? Like if someone is overwhelmed, someone like I was like 18 months ago and I'm like, yeah, there's no point. You know, what, what do you have to say to those folks? Well, you can overcome. It. You just have to be willing to face it. Look at it for what it is. Take it step by step. Get you some understanding. Utilize those resources and 
continue down that path until you reach a goal. What's one thing someone can do every day? Every day, you can monitor your credit. You can keep your journal to determine if you meet your goals or not. What's working, what's what's working, what's not working, hmm. what you could do better, what you could show up. I mean, because I have to do it too. You know, I'm going to be honest with you mm -hmm. on a day-to-day -day basis. I have a budget, but sometimes I get off track. Mm. <laughs> and so every week I have to kind of look and say, hey, yeah, maybe I true. didn't need this or... Well, maybe I, I could, instead of trying to say $300, maybe I can just put 50 here and, you know, making those different adjustments. So yeah. I would say always keep your journal, always monitor your behavior. You know, one thing I'm going to add on top of this, and I don't know where this fits into your program, but but I'm going to I'm gonna layer it on top because this, hey. it's, it's part of what we all need to do is as much as we all need to, like, Handle your credit, pay your bills, of course, save for your future. We all need to break a little something off for charity. And uh, one of the things we're doing here is we have a company called Charity on Top that we work with. And you can literally buy like a gift card. So like, let's say I'm going to get Darius something. I know Darius doesn't need another shirt. He's got all the shirts he needs. But I can go out and I can buy a charity gift card and go, hey, man, I donated $10 on behalf of you. And you get to say, well, that's awesome. I, I know exactly the charity I want. And they go onto the website, bam, you know, they, they you apply the, the card towards that. And there's all kinds of programs and ways to directly feed it. So one of the things we do here on the Break It Down show is we link people directly to charity on top so that they can put money in. And then, and then we, you know, as the pile builds, we send it out to these different charities that we're involved with. And it's just a, it's a cool thing. And we all can do that. We can all, there's, you know, basically it's like an eight corn but for charity where even though just tiny little bits of money but over the course of a year all of a sudden it's 500 bucks and how many times have you given 500 bucks to a charity in your lifetime you know i think that's that is noble and i would love to join in if i can in any form or fashion you yeah. know i should you know give back to our you know to the less fortunate or anybody who needs so, yeah you know totally and there are so many charity. I mean, Charity on Top's linked to literally every legitimate charity. And you, within that, you can even assess, like, the strengths of the charities themselves. But, yeah, like, a dollar a day is $350. You know, that's that's going to do a lot for that charity to help them. You know, just the money flowing in, right, instead of having to, like, well, it's your birthday or, well, it's graduation or this horrible event happened and we're all going to give money. You can literally right. nickel and dime. And, and if that is powerful for that charity to get that $365, think about what that does in your checking account or in your savings account, you know, as you're doing the same thing. It's, uh, right. Man, it's just – it's little small steps, man. You're right. Just taking little steps and – uh I, Absolutely. I appreciate it. Hey, you know, I would love for yeah. you to connect me with one of those charities. I would love to donate every other week myself. Yeah, I'll, I'll for sure do it. Matter of fact, when I put the show up, I'll put a link in there. And uh, anybody who wants to chip in can just put, put money into the, like the Break It Down show pot. We don't see a cent of it. A hundred percent of it passes through. And then we'll either pick a charity from the charities that we've had on here or, or, you know, just direct us to send it to somewhere. But, yeah, off from there, and, and we'll make um, charity, charity on top, be just part of our overall life financial plan. Right. Absolutely. I, I, I love that. I love that concept. Yeah, man. Me too. That's why we're doing it. It's fantastic. Hey, everybody, I want you to one more time take a look at Darius's profile. He's on LinkedIn. He's on Twitter. He's got his own website called rewriting financial rules llc.com you can get him on twitter at i'm on twitter at Norm, norman love reps yeah and i'm on instagram at norman zone 88 and i'm on facebook on my business page at rewriting financial rules cool that means we can definitely get a hold of you there and and hey let's have you on every now and then and talk about uh you know check in with each other and see how we're all doing and hold each other accountable i'm getting uh getting our money going in the right direction and working for us instead of somebody else absolutely absolutely it would be a pleasure anytime cool. i enjoy it i really enjoyed this thanks man i appreciate it